the thing that a convicted defendant on sentence wants to hear is not the moralizing judge telling him that he's behaved very badly. He wants to hear the number. The number. How long am I going inside for? And when they are sentenced to an IPP and they hear the tariff of two years or five years or ten years, that's the number that sticks in their mind. And it's only when they get into the prison van does it dawn upon them that it doesn't actually mean two years, it means forever. The practical reality of the IPP sentencing system is a fundamental miscarriage of justice. Most people locked up on IPP sentences have suffered grave, grave, torturous injustice. Because he was IPP, the prison system was becoming a very, very aware that they was being forgotten about. He became a ghost prisoner. People on indeterminate sentences have just that hopelessness around the indeterminacy, and I think we can't underestimate how distressing it is to live with no sense of control in your life. As their mental health becomes worse in prison, it can be seen as a reason for keeping them in prison. For those that are still in prison with the IPP sentencing, they have just been forgotten. They will continue to be forgotten until somebody steps in and does something about it. My name's Clara White. I'm the eldest sister of Thomas White, who is a straight-serving IPP. He was sentenced to two years tariff of IPP, but remains in prison almost 11 years later for street robbery of a mobile phone. My brother Wayne Bell, he was just 17 at the time. He stole a bike from a teenager who we know. He was sentenced on an IPP with review. So to the day, he's been in prison for 16 years. There was no weapon, no weapon involved. His time stopped 16 years ago. The Imprisonment for Public Protection sentence, known as the IPP sentence, is in a former life sentence in the English sense. So you have a tariff period, which is what the, the offence committed is worth. And then beyond that, you have potentially lifelong imprisonment, which is indeterminate. So the person will only be able to achieve release if they can convince a parole board that it's no longer necessary for the protection of the public that they remain detained in prison. Whereas the determinate sentence prisoner knows that there is an end date to their sentence, the IPP prisoner has no idea. The idea was initially quite a good idea with the intention of having prisoners rehabilitated before they were released into the community. Unfortunately, whilst everything looked good, on the drawing board, in practice, it was a complete disaster. When you're serving an IPP sentence, you have to do progressive courses. The idea is, is that throughout that tariff, that IPP prisoner complies with that sentence plan and once having completed it, is therefore able to demonstrate that they have reduced their risk and can apply for their release into the community. Thomas, he was in Norwich prison for two years. That prison does not have a progressive programme. On the ground, there just aren't enough programme facilitators, there aren't enough programmes available for prisoners. As a result, many prisoners end up being significantly over tariff because they are still waiting to undertake these offender behaviour programmes. Many offenders we know only too well um, come from very difficult, if not deprived, backgrounds. It's not to excuse what they do, of course. Offending is often a matter of choice. And, of course, there are many caught up in the criminal justice system who've got mental health issues, drug issues, and really shouldn't be in the criminal justice system. They should be dealt with elsewhere. Once you know 
that the state is engaging in cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment of people who have often mental health issues, cognitive disorders, traumatic brain injury, history of abuse, diagnosable diseases. The answer is not to continue to contain them in a prison, but to release them with the appropriate services. The psychological impact of a custodial sentence is significant on all prisoners. However, this is significantly greater for somebody on an indeterminate sentence for public protection. The miserable reality of people on IPP sentences is there's a very good chance that they will kill themselves. If you're a prisoner, you're twice as likely to kill yourself as a member of the general population. If you're an IPP prisoner, you're twice again as likely to kill yourself. 70 people have hung themselves on IPP. 70 people have taken their lives on, on this sentence. My brother could have been number 71. In my experience, the United Kingdom does have a draconian criminal justice system. And one of the major factors for this is that it's a vote winner for politicians. Sometimes people will say it's harsh and authoritarian to talk of having a tough crime policy. But crime makes decent people frightened and vulnerable. There's loads of work in other countries about having shorter sentences and therapeutic outcomes that means those countries don't have the crime statistics that England and Wales has. The IPP sentence was introduced in 2005. I stand before you as the first leader in the Labour Party's history to win three full consecutive terms in office. The IPP sentence came into being during a, a long period of new Labour government. This was a period where Tony Blair as Prime Minister was very keen to ensure that the Labour Party were really taking firm action on crime. There is a real feeling within the criminal justice system today that change is happening. However, as fast as we act, as tough as it seems, compared to the 1970s and 1980s, for the public, it's not fast or tough enough. And you had uh, David Blunkett as Home Secretary coming in. Back in 2003 with the Criminal Justice and Sentencing Act, we thought that we were taking steps that would be beneficial rather than would end up with this, yes, let me call it a disaster which has occurred uh, over those uh, subsequent 18 years. In the earlier period of that Labour government, you had the creation of the ASBO, the Antisocial Behaviour Order, and where that can be seen to connect with the IPP sentence is through their desire to use the criminal justice system to address social problems and increase public safety or the sense of public safety. Unlike the life sentence, which is only available for 11 types of offences, the IPP was handed out for a range of 153 different types of offences. Some which were undoubtedly very serious, but some which were arguably not particularly serious. And of course, within any type of offence, there are different levels of seriousness within that. There's no doubt that there are people in prison on IPP sentences who, if they'd been given a determinate sentence or if they were sentenced today, they would serve a year, two years, and they would be out of prison, and that's a scandal. It is, it's, it's terrible. You had a situation where the Home Secretary at the time decided that the senior judiciary and indeed trial judges couldn't be trusted, that they were too liberal. Home that... Secretary, this is bound to annoy the judges. Is that something you're bothered about? Well, it's certainly not the objective. The objective is clarity and consistency. The objective is to build confidence again in the criminal justice and sentencing system. So measures were taken to toughen up the IPP sentence to make it near mandatory in terms of whether judges could apply it or whether they had to apply it. So that undoubtedly had an effect in terms of the way it was used in practice and the numbers of people that were sentenced to it. I think we can look at the statistics and see that they were, if you like, dished out a lot. And then after a while, the judiciary realised that this was not an appropriate way to sentence people. 
that there was some education of the judiciary, that these were having cruel and perhaps unintended consequences. In 2010, unexpectedly, you have a coalition government between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party as the majority party. You have uh, Ken Clark, the um, very experienced MP, becomes Justice Secretary. So he takes the view that the IPP sentence is, is entirely wrong. Government's policy is they must be replaced, and we brought forward proposals to do so. Uh, my proposals to replace them with tough, determinate sentences have inevitably aroused criticism from both the right and the left, as I was slightly complaining yesterday, and that is the story of my life. Uh, I really uh, do think what we're doing is replacing a regime which did not work as intended with one which gives the fullest possible protection to the public from serious, violent and sexual crime. Uh, the sentences in their present form are unclear, inconsistent, and they've been used far more than was ever intended or contemplated by either government or parliament when the sentence was first created. In 2012, the European Court of Human Rights said that IPP sentences were inhumane. So the decision is taken that the IPP sentence should be abolished. They were subsequently struck from the statute books in the UK but no retrospective justice was done. Where the challenge laid more at the time was in what to do about the thousands of people who were already serving IPP sentences. The Prime Minister, David Cameron, took over as the public face of these sentencing reforms. The changes we propose will need to maintain or strengthen the protection of the public so they can have full confidence in the system. This is a non-negotiable red line for me and for this government. In 2010, when the coalition government came to fruition, there was deep, deep cuts to the Ministry of Justice and in turn that impacted on Her Majesty's prison service. Uh, the, the cuts were deep, they were severe. We lost a lot of experienced staff in voluntary exit programmes. As 2010 became 2011, 40 inmates at the Ford Prison in West Sussex rioted. There's been criticism of the initial staffing levels which couldn't cope. We should be providing on behalf of the public um, sufficient places and sufficient staff to deal with the prisoners that we've got. We say we are a thousand prison officers short and yet they want to look to make people redundant over the next few years. But that really did hit the prison service hard. And it's only now that the Comte probably recognised that. The cuts to the budgets didn't allow prisoners actually to do the offending behaviour programmes that were necessary to fulfil the obligation of that sentence. So therefore some people were on minor crimes and not, not ever been able to get out. So it was unbelievable the way that they got themselves into that predicament. So the law changed because it was known and evidenced that this re had reached the point of being torturous. Now, trying to get that message across, to change laws that then appear to be softer, is very, very difficult. The practical reality is they should never have been there in the first place. There was never enough evidence to support the IPP regime. In many respects, I, I do think the public are manipulated by the media in the country, the narrative about who can be toughest on crime. No one writes headlines about man released from prison uh, doesn't commit crime for 10 years, is functional member of society. That's a boring story. What's a great story is someone leaves prison two weeks later and they murder someone. It's the parole board's fault. In its concept of trying to say we're going to protect society from the most violent of crimes, it, the concept is good where nobody thought there was going to be 8,000 prisoners on IPP. That, that's the reality of things. I've been in now, coming up 11 years. I'm so sorry to everyone, including my family, as they're also victims. 
you know, I've educated myself whilst being in jail. I've also found myself in very dark spots. But, you know, they say what don't kill you can only make you stronger. At the time, he was very drunk. He got talking to two men. He wanted to use their phone and then he stole the phone off them. What never gets aired is that Thomas actually hugged one of them and kissed the other one on the forehead. Wayne went out to the park with his friends and there was a dare between them both to take a bike. And Wayne being Wayne, he did it. And he was arrested that day. So Wayne's in hospital now. He actually arrived three years ago in the catatonic state, in a wheelchair, unable to walk, get out of bed, refused to eat. He just wanted to die. That then turned into psychosis and schizophrenia. And then he had severe depression as well. I, I know that Wayne's sentence is what's made him ill. Initially, they were young men or women uh, in some cases, but largely young men uh, would come in who were not severely mentally ill. Right. But as the years have gone by, increasingly what we are finding is they are becoming mentally ill. Their clinical presentation is increasingly akin to those who have been wrongfully convicted. So the mental health implications of the IP sentence uh, are enormous. And this was recognised right from the beginning. Uh, the Centre for Mental Health produced a report highlighting just what a huge negative impact the sentence did have and would be having on people's mental health. And that's continued to be the case. Having mental health problems is very shameful for some people. And so it's only more recently that it's been talked about in general and in, in the public. The reality is, is that life in a custodial setting can be compared in certain prisons to life in a war zone. It is horrific. It is a very dangerous environment, and it is an environment where your psychological well-being will be seriously harmed. You're not being weak as a criminal justice system by providing for a health outcome. You're actually being responsible and ensuring that there is a reduction in crime because you're reducing the risk of people who have those issues that contribute to what they do. Once he got into his eighth year, he started to deteriorate quite badly because there was just no hope whatsoever. He was starting to give up. He'd always ring me and, and just, he'd be really upset, crying, Alana, help, what have I done? What is it I've done that's so bad because I'm seeing murderers walk free? And that's when it really hit him. He just couldn't cope with it anymore. As the years started to go by, Thomas started to get really mentally unstable. We really started to know on the phone that he's becoming very sick. He'd ring home and talk in Roman numerals. He believed he was John the Baptist at one time, believing he was Jesus Christ. And the prison system just didn't know what to do with him. So a lot of the times he would be segregated and he would just spend long, long periods of time in, in segregation. That, that's where he was, he was most comfortable in, in segregation. And he, 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 would, he would ask to go down there because he could talk to himself without being laughed at and, and be these characters who he thought he was. So he preferred to be in the most worst place in, in segregation and just where he could just, where his mental health could just do what it wanted and nobody would laugh at him and, and he could just talk to these characters um, and, and, and be these characters of the Bible and, and I do believe that um, that became his that that just became his life. He'd done that much time 
um, in segregation that it would become really hard to be around people. Wayne doesn't believe anything we say. He has times where he won't come to the phone. He doesn't want to talk to us. He went two years without speaking to us and only reached out, I think it was last year. So if someone is um, psychiatrically ill, it's very difficult then to, to house them within a prison. Some prisons have a, a hospital wing, as it were, so they would have an inpatient service, um, and less and less prisons have that now. Prison doesn't have enough options to deal with somebody whose behaviour they can't manage on the wing. It is really clear that segregating them, that we use the expression segregation, it is solitary confinement. Um, that imposing solitary confinement on somebody in a mental health crisis is really not, it, what's the way of putting this? It's, it's inhumane. It is sometimes used for people whose self-harming is cannot be controlled and that should not happen. I'm just thinking what you and I would do if we were a prison officer in that situation and we had a wing of however many hundred prisoners and somebody who was behaving in such a volatile way that everybody was at risk. One said, I'm always walking on eggshells and there's no chance of me ever being free until I'm dead, whether that's through natural causes or because I can't cope with it. He spoke for many about their feelings of never being truly free while they were under that sentence. What happens to someone once they're released from prison? The IPP sentence, someone is on license for life. are recalled to prison having committed a further offence, but they can be recalled for prison for behaviour that doesn't constitute a serious and imminent risk to the safety of others. You would think of being in the community as being a, a comforting experience, but many described it as intensely anxious producing because they knew one mistake, not that they were back in prison, but they were back in prison indefinitely. Quite reminds me of something by Kafka, my lords, or perhaps Catch-22. Crucial to this story is the growth of actuarial risk assessments. So in other words, trying to predict the future based on the past in a structured way. The growing idea and the growing belief that one could structure those assessments in a way that meant one could identify people who were significantly dangerous and one could manage those risks in prison or in the community to improve public safety. Now, in a sense, that's inherently very appealing. That's intrinsically seems sensible if we can do that. We like to think that risk is being controlled, but I'm not convinced that it is. I think we just go in for containment and hope for the best. We've yet to find, I think, better ways of controlling the risk presented to society by certain individuals. We know that risk assessment is imprecise. It's never going to tell us 100% these people are going to commit another offence and these people aren't. It's a judgment. Psychological risk, risk assessment particularly is a judgment. It's an informed judgment and it's a structured judgment that's based on research, but it's ultimately a judgment. People talk about you know, the risk assessment processes are the most stressful parts of a sentence. People have described, you know, feeling so ill they, they thought they were in cardiac arrest. It creates so much anxiety um, and so much stress. I mean, risk assessments are, um, by their nature, um, meant for big groups of people and we're dealing with individuals. IPPs are being punished for what they might do in future if they're released. This is preventive detention it's uh, essentially internment, a concept previously. Uh, we've always thought alien and uh, inimical uh, to our system of law. The people who are on the IPP sentences are now serving sentences that cannot by law be given in this country. If that's not a miscarriage of justice, then I don't know what is. This sentence was, is unjust, was proven to be unjust, was a stain, is a stain on British justice. Most prisons have a very high rate of victimization of, of people either committing crimes against each other or exploiting people in some way. And when 
a short-term prisoner knows that our indeterminate prisoner cannot risk a confrontation, that puts the indeterminate sentence prisoner at a considerable risk of being exploited because they can't fight back. Yeah, one person said to me, if I fight back, that person who was threatening me might lose their privileges for two weeks. I lose two to three years of my life. The IPP sentence does result in a vicious cycle. Risk assessments. Anxiety. Tariff. For our world. Life sentence. Risk assessments. Anxiety. Tariff. And that vicious circle within the IPP sentence is the exact opposite of the argument that was made at its creation. The argument made at its creation was that it was wonderful because it would incentivize relevant prisoners to reform and to rehabilitate because they could see their way out of the system and that they would get meaningful help while they're in there. For the vast majority of prisoners, that, that can't be said to have been the case. You'd think Wayne had killed someone by the way he's been treated. And even those that, that are murderers and rapists get treated better. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. Because it's supposed to be two years, he was in no, he's been in like 11. It's just not right, he shouldn't be in there that long. It's affected Thomas and Caden having a relationship because of the stigma of, of the IPP. He's not been allowed to see his own child, and I believe that is a breach of Article 8, is his human rights, the right to family life. I read something about children, and one of the children had said, not my crime, still my time. And I, I thought that was so powerful. The saddest things, I think, for the IPP families on the outside is, we trusted them, they had a duty of care, they had a duty of care to look after my brother. And they didn't, they failed him. We just want Wayne home, alive. My mum has nightmares every night. She's, her anxiety is through the roof. She, she feels as if she's already lost him. It was so bad. Um, this was about four or five, maybe four or five years ago. I was so, and I was so ashamed of what, what I prayed. I'd, I'd welcomed the idea of suicide for him. I'd welcomed it because I was being tormented. He was being tormented with his sentence. We couldn't help him. I, I couldn't help him. No one could help him. He was diagnosed in, in the year 2016 with psychosis and borderline personality disorder, ADHD. My brother has only been on the Beacon unit that's run by the NHS for nine months, that's it. We've got IPP cases where people have been contained, not treated, and have got sicker and sicker and sicker. And we tend to use the phrase, they've got worse. But actually what we mean is their mental health problems have got worse. And unless you can engage in a system that allows for that treatment, then it's a state that is creating a cruel system. They're helping me here now, do you know what I mean? Like, there's one thing I've got to say for the Beacon unit, you know, you have your up days and your down days, but, you know, these people are, are here to help. They care, don't they? Yeah, they care, they really care, yeah. You yeah, know? they are. And, um, yeah. It's a whole completely different world I'm in now. Like, it's like the world I was in when I was in Norwich and, and Chelmsford. It was, it was a mental torture, physical torture, spiritual torture. You know, it was just crazy. It's like it was every, me against the world sort of thing. I love you and, yeah, ring. I love you to bits, our kid. Bye -bye. Right, take care. Bye. The Beacon is a great place, but he will spend another two years 
on there, which will take us to 13 years because he has to do a two-year programme. I think it's a good time to look at IPP sentences again, to consider those who are left as to how we might progress them to release, and also to stop and think of what terrible thing we did and make sure we don't do it again. The fallout from an IPP sentence at least demonstrates that the system is still geared toward re towards retribution. We're learning things now that we didn't know at the time the people got the sentences, and so all we can do really moving forward is to try to help people from what we know now and try to apply risk assessment tools which are more appropriate culturally and in terms of neurodiversity. What we should be doing, surely, is making sure that our prisons work and that we are rehabilitating people and that the prison population is actually dropping. But we have this central problem that over 8,000 people received this sentence. Therefore, the solutions must involve something that applies to all of those 8,000 plus people and their families. The responsibility lies with government to resolve this situation for all of those people serving an IPP. What politicians and governments need to understand, whether it's a Conservative government, whether it's a coalition government, whether it's a Labour government, stop playing political football with sentencing and who can be the toughest on crime. I'm very conscious that uh, the suggestion of resentencing for a determinate period is one which has a, a lot of support um, from ju the judiciary. I genuinely need to keep all the options open at the moment until we've got the, the full set of evidence in. We're trying, we're trying, we're doing our best. But if they don't want you to win, they'll make, sh they'll make sure of that. That we're not winners. This situation cannot go on. We have to do something for the sake of the individuals and their families, and by the way, for the safety of the community. I got it wrong. The government now have the chance to get it right. Stuck in the jail house. They got me locked up like an animal. Hitting the gym, going one more. Got to prove wrong to my family. That's why I'm doing the courses available. That's why I gotta stay focused, focus on my dean. Praying for the forgiveness for them sins I commit as a teen. Every five day, drum and canteen. Them fiends on the wing, burning berries. Smoky, can't even breathe. To the game with no wedding ring And brown skin, she got melanin And she ride it like a Bible, she ain't better than